You know, we know so much of what Ravi said, but we want to get to know him even more. We want you to get to know him more. So we love the stories from his team, but we also love some of his favorite things, which is exactly what this tribute in the hall is all about. Every single person walking through gets a moment just to stop and see Ravi just a little bit closer. We want to make sure you have that opportunity. And then the infamous Black Bear. He was an early adopter of cell phones, and he was loyal to this one right here. Cracked screen and all. This Black Bear is how he stayed connected to people all throughout the world. One of the greatest things that he was admired for. But it's also where his thumbs would do the working on all the articles that we read in many of the publications. This is the device that he typed as he sat in the air and wrote some of the most impactful articles that so many of us read. Welcome to Friendly Banjo Atheist. My name is Steve Boffman. Did evangelist Ravi Zacharias threaten suicide in order to cover up an online affair he was having with a married woman? Here's what we know from court documents filed in a lawsuit that was brought by Ravi Zacharias on July 31st, 2017. These documents are posted at RaviWatch.com and I encourage you not to trust me. Read them for yourself. In April of 2017, Ravi received a demand letter from an attorney in Paducah, Kentucky named Mark Bryant. The letter was marked personal and extremely confidential and I think I know why. It accuses Ravi of becoming a spiritual guide for a Canadian woman named Lori Ann Thompson and exploiting her vulnerability to satisfy his own sexual desires. It also accuses Mr. Zacharias of soliciting and receiving many indecent photos of Laurie Ann Thompson. In the most explosive part of the letter, Mr. Bryant claims that when his client said she would tell her husband about what had happened, Ravi threatened in an email to end his life and bid the world goodbye. The attorney claimed to have a copy of that email. The letter demanded $5 million in exchange for not launching public litigation. Now let me briefly interrupt my presentation of straight facts here and tell you that as a lawyer, I'm on Ravi's side here legally. This letter is sloppily written, devoid of persuasive legal analysis, and it smells like a demand for hush money. But the big problem for the Thompsons is that in real life, Lori Ann Thompson is a smart, active, entrepreneurial mother of four with loads of life experience, and her lawyer's trying to pass her off as a shrinking violet who deserves millions of dollars because she could not draw online boundaries with a gentleman who lives 800 miles away in another country. The Thompsons may be beautiful people, I don't know, but I'm just telling you, that seems to me like it's going to be a tough sell. Be that as it may, I'm not really interested in Ravi's legal issues, I'm interested in his moral issues is the great apologist who travels the world preaching and lecturing to people about Christian morality actually a sexual hypocrite? Is Ravi Zacharias actually yet another example of the sanctifying power of the blood of Jesus Christ not being all it's cracked up to be? Fortunately, we don't need to engage in a he said, she said battle between the Thompsons and Mr. Zacharias because Ravi tells us a lot right here in the complaint he filed in federal court. So as we proceed, I'm going to be assuming that everything Ravi says here is true and I'm going to disregard everything the Thompsons say. I'm just going to assume for the sake of discussion that the Thompsons are just a dishonest couple out to get Ravi Zacharias. The problem is they got him. Watch really closely. On July 31st, Ravi filed a federal extortion and racketeering lawsuit against Lori Ann Thompson and her husband Bradley Thompson, claiming that they'd conspired to get him in a compromising position so they could demand hush money. Here's how it all began. He met the couple at a conference in Canada in October of 2014. He and Lori Ann began a friendly correspondence in which she repeatedly contacted him. Because Ravi travels in countries that are hostile to Christianity and he has received death threats from these countries, And because hacking attempts have been made against his electronic devices, he wanted a more secure method of communication with Lorianne, so he gave her his BlackBerry contact information. BlackBerry encrypts data using a symmetrical encryption algorithm known as AES-256. Ms. Thompson began to escalate her relationship with plaintiff through repeated and persistent BlackBerry messages, emails, and by sending gifts to Ravi. And she eventually introduced inappropriate and sexual topics, even expressing her love for him. In February of 2016, nearly a year and a half after they met, she began sending him photos 
innocuous ones at first, but then sexual and nude ones. At some unspecified time, Ravi asked her to stop sending such materials, but she kept at it, saying she could not help herself. At some other unspecified time, Ravi tried to block her messages, and he sought to end their friendship. A few weeks before October 29, 2016, Ravi cut off all contact with Ms. Thompson. Despite having cut off all contact with Ms. Thompson several weeks before October 29th, on October 29th, he received an email from Lorianne saying she was going to tell her husband what had been going on. Ravi was worried about his reputation being unfairly tarnished, and despite having cut off all contact with Ms. Thompson, he continued to plead with her not to escalate the situation. Despite having cut off all contact with Ms. Thompson, Ravi remained amicable out of fear for his family's safety and of potential damage to his professional reputation if he upset the Thompsons. Despite having cut off all contact with Ms. Thompson several weeks before October 29th, on November 16th, Ravi received a text message from Ms. Thompson's phone number. Now, if you're getting the feeling that Ravi wasn't real serious about this whole cut off all contact with Lori Ann thing, you're not alone. In what follows, you're going to see what looks like an admission of online sexual wrongdoing by Ravi Zacharias. Again, I'm reading from Ravi's own court filing. I have no idea why his lawyer disclosed what you're about to see, but here it is. See what you think. By January 19th, the excrement had hit the fan, and Mr. Thompson sent an email to Ravi asking, Why would you ask Lorianne to send you photos of herself? Five days later, Ravi replied, This is what I consider the explosive paragraph 75 Please read it for yourself. It's over there at RaviWatch.com. Ravi replied, Let me answer your question as best as I can without risk of seeming to avoid the full force of the responsibility. Although he denied initiating or proposing that action, he stated that the blame is real and inescapable. He also revealed that when Lorianne came to Atlanta to visit him, he deliberately left town so as to avoid continuing what was wrong. On April 26, Mr. Bryant delivered the $5 million so-called extortion letter to Ravi, and Ravi then reported the matter to his governance committee and hired counsel. Now, assuming everything Ravi says here is true, it's clear that at very least he demonstrated extremely bad boundaries in getting himself into this sexual situation in the first place and extremely bad boundaries in getting himself out of it. Why didn't he report this to his governance committee the moment Miss Thompson expressed inappropriate affections towards him. Was he having fun? He says he was worried about his professional reputation being tarnished, but what exactly did he do that got himself into a situation where he had to worry about his reputation in the first place? Whatever went on between the two of them, Ravi crossed enough boy-girl boundaries with Lorianne that when she came to visit him in Georgia, he couldn't just tell her no or tell his receptionist that he could not meet this person. He had to flee. Ravi's been doing some other fleeing lately. Some folks, when they file a lawsuit, they courageously stand on the courthouse steps, they hold a press conference, and they field questions from friend and foe alike. What did Ravi do? It's called file and flee. Just as he filed this lawsuit, he fled to an undisclosed third world country where it's so dangerous he can't even tell us its name. And what will undoubtedly be his mantra during this litigation, he blogged from that dangerous country and said, I can't say much till we're out of here. Now, Ravi's a very busy man and it's unusual for him to disappear and have a whole month unscheduled on his calendar. But after his self-imposed exile comes to an end, his first scheduled public appearance is on September 9th, where he will lecture some lucky folks in India on, guess what, living with clear boundaries. Those are the facts. Here's my prediction. We'll never know what went on between Ravi and Lorianne because the Thompsons have too much dirt on him that he's going to settle this case for whatever it takes. Did you notice he never denied sending that suicide email? Ravi's lawsuit is simply a preemptive move to put pressure on the Thompsons to settle for maybe 30 pieces of silver. He's assembled a high-powered legal team, including three hotshots from a fancy New York and Boston law firm. The case will go away. Ravi will make a tearful confession to vague and unspecified boundary violations. His donors and his devotees will forgive him, and he'll be back to business as usual as the great apologist of our time. Thank you for tuning in. I encourage each of you to review the court documents at RaviWatch.com and contact Mr. Zacharias personally. Here's his email. I would not normally reveal that to the public, but his lawyer for some reason made it a matter of public record, so there you have it. Also, 
Write to Ms. Malhotra at pr at rzim.org and let them know that the time has come for Ravi Zacharias to publicly address the allegations that are mounting against him.